The Russian Empire was the largest geographically continuous empire of the 20th century, a titan of both unbridled size and manpower, something which almost made up for its primitive technological state in comparison to the rest of Europe and lack of industry. This, however, proved to be especially disastrous for the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War, when that massive army could not be transported to the front lines of the sparsely populated Far East in time, leading the war to quickly favor the far smaller but increasingly more industrialized Japanese islands with a developed navy that the Russians simply couldn't match. Russia stretched itself to the breaking point in World War I when Tsar Nicholas II had, in the eyes of the Russian people, condemned millions of their sons to die in a conflict which was not theirs to fight. One they would eventually lose, and the blame of which would be pinned squarely on the Tsar. The Russian Empire collapsed. In its place rose the USSR, following the heat of a brutal revolution and civil war. But, what if all that never happened? Happy Halloween audience, Mr. Z here, and before we get into today's scenario, I need to mention our terrifically generous sponsor, World of Tanks, for helping make this video possible. There's a link in the description of this video for a free download of the game. Every one of you that signs up boosts the funding for this channel. And in the wake of the EU censorship of us, our views and YouTube revenue has been weighed down. The game is absolutely terrific. It has nice graphics, environments, and is just plainly pretty to look at, but more importantly, it plays incredibly well. It has terrific mechanics, etc, etc. So, without further ado, back to the scenario. Many of the issues which led Russia down the path of collapse can be squarely attributed to the reign of Tsar Nicholas II. He had assumed the throne before his father had fully prepared him to lead the empire, and had throughout his reign lost favor with many of his subjects, from his rejection of adopting a constitutional monarchy at the beginning of his reign, to his humiliating defeat in the Russo-Japanese War, his firing upon a crowd of protesters in what would become known as Bloody Sunday, and the list goes on. Entering into World War I, Russia had only one advantage, its massive number of soldiers. However, given outdated weaponry, a lack of training, and little industry back home to produce necessary munitions, the Great Army of Russia would become little more than cannon fodder, a barricade to break through rather than an enemy to fight for the German army. Russia's greatest advantage became a massive casualty list. The Russian Empire's three greatest hurdles to overcome if it wished to survive would be proper leadership, industrialization, and political reformation. We could propose a timeline where Tsar Nicholas is simply a better leader, but then he wouldn't really be Tsar Nicholas anymore. Instead, we'll use a leader who already existed and could have led Russia down a better direction, Nicholas's father, Alexander III. Alexander had died at the age of 49 from a kidney disease, but not this time. In this timeline, Tsar Alexander lives to a ripe old age well into 1940 and serves as Tsar until the 1920s. Alexander believed that Russia would one day see revolution from the various ethnic and cultural groups within its borders, much as Austria and the Ottomans would see in the wake of World War I. Alexander's solution was an enforcing of Russian orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, a policy known by some as restoration and reaction, or as some critics had called it, Russification. Alexander's ideal future was a nation composed of a single nationality, language, and religion, as well as one form of governmental administration. He attempted to realize this by instituting mandatory teaching of the Russian language throughout the empire, including to his German, Polish, and other non-Russian subjects through the promotion of Eastern Orthodoxy, by abolishing any German, Polish, and Swedish organizations within the empire, and by the weakening of Judaism by persecuting the Jews. Alexander also, during his reign, weakened the authority of nobles and regional councils, instead establishing the role of land captains, and creating an imperial administration from which the Tsar could project his authority to the local level. Assassination attempts on Alexander were made, most notably by the terrorist organization Narodnaya Volya, of which Vladimir Lenin's brother was a member of, leading to his arrest and execution. Arguably the greatest threat Alexander's regime faced were the famines of 1891 and the cholera epidemic of 1892, which Russia in its still pre-industrial state couldn't cope with. The Tsar had ambitions of expanding Russian influence southward into the Middle East, but had to tread lightly as to not step on the toes of Britain, who held dominance in the region. Alexander was notably good at averting war and maintaining strong diplomacy with other European powers, something which would come in handy later down the line. So, Alexander III survives, Nicholas II has yet to become Tsar, and is still in training. Russia continues undergoing Alexander's policy of Russification, a system that had also been implemented by the USSR to notable success. Even in the absence of religious practice, Russian Orthodoxy continued to grow under the Soviet regime behind closed doors. Tsar Nicholas had attempted to continue his father's policies and legacies in our timeline, but simply couldn't do so with the same effectiveness in quelling crowds and suppressing opposition. 
Alexandra Wood, on the industrial side, funneled greater and greater funds into the development of the Trans-Siberian Railway to bring the nation under a tighter grip, while also pushing for greater industrialization in the West, mimicking the tactics of Japan's industrialization. Speaking of Japan, tensions begin to grow between the two empires of Russia and Japan over claims to Korea and Manchuria. Alexandra, while diplomatic, would likely still, instead of compromising, demand the whole of Korea, triggering a preemptive strike from Japan in which Port Arthur would be captured. In our timeline, the Japanese captured the entire Russian Pacific fleet in Port Arthur, forcing the Russian Baltic fleet to make a nine-month voyage all the way to the Far East, only to be destroyed. In this timeline, Alexander recognizes the financial toll that this war would have on Russia and that there was no easy way to defeat the Japanese who had already captured their fleet. Alexander calls for peace with Japan and cedes a significant portion of Korea, but maintains Manchuria and lives to fight another day to reclaim what they saw as rightful Russian clay. Another factor to take into account would be Alexander's persecution of the Jews within Russia. In our timeline, Alexander and Nicholas oversaw a series of pogroms against their Jewish populations. However, Nicholas would relent following the assassination of Russian Prime Minister Peter Stolop by radical Jewish agent Dmitry Bogrov. Alexander, being more of a hardliner than Nicholas, would not hold back and only see the Jewish population of Russia as both standing in the way of Russification and a growing threat to the Russian government, as many of these persecuted Jews would go on to become leading or even founding members of the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, from Leon Trotsky and Maxim Litmanov to Lev Kamenev and even Lenin himself. Had Alexander pressed harder, it may have been enough to either A, snuff out the roots of the Bolshevik Revolution before it even gained traction, or B, incite an ethnic revolt within Russia, potentially balkanizing the empire again as had been seen in Austria. The Jewish population of Russia, along with the Kazakhs, Cossacks, Poles, Tatars, Chechens, Yakuts, and many, many, many more, would either see their cultures eradicated in the Russification process, or would almost inevitably fight to break away when Russia was weak enough. Here's a little reference. This is the Russian Empire, and here are its domains. Now, let's see who would be most likely to break away. The Poles, for one, as well as any other groups that broke away from the Empire in our timeline following the fall of the Empire. Kazakhstan, the Caucasus Nations, Ukraine, Tuva, maybe even Komi, and perhaps a good lot of the groups within Yakuta. In absence of these regions, Russia is but some pretty spooky looking border gore. And if we were to cut out the non-Slavic regions altogether, then we'd have something kind of like this. Now, it's unlikely that all these regions would break away, either due to a lack of capability, military strength, etc, etc. But I I'd imagine at least a few would. Now, something else that we need to take into factor would be Russia could not enter World War I as an aggressor, or even in defense of an ally. The human cost would lead the Tsar to become unpopular and perceived as a man willing to simply throw Russian lives into a meat grinder of war without legitimate threat. Russia could enter the conflict only if it were invaded by Germany or Austria first and act in defense of itself. In this timeline, the Russian Empire doesn't collapse, but rather in the wake of World War I, ethnic tension builds to a boiling point. Russia performed well in the war, having been industrialized enough to lead a pushback into the West. However, their soldiers would still be exhausted to the point of being unable to quell uprisings within Poland. And that's really it. Russia has an odd history with the many ethnic groups within its borders. However, history has shown that when push came to shove, even in the face of full-on revolution, Russia still kept its rebellious roommates in check. Only Poland, in both this and our timeline, has been capable of warding off Russia and for a good deal of reasons. Notably, the fact that it neighbors allies, isn't landlocked, and has an extensive military history free of the Russian Empire. Unlike nearly every other group, which is landlocked within Russian borders, and doesn't have a notably powerful military or lacks history free of Russian rule and culture. Even today, the Russian Federation has kept itself from fracturing into numerous smaller states by establishing a federation of subject states, which, while autonomous, are reliant upon and cooperate with the Russian government. Kind of like the proposed United States of Austria, which I cover in this video here. Poland and its independence movement would attract the hands of numerous dissatisfied minority groups across Russia who had been unable to establish independence movements of their own. Thus, Poland would see a significant rise in their populations of Finnic, Jewish, and Ukrainian inhabitants, as well as many more of which would flee the persecution of the Tsar and likely establish their own enclaves within Poland. The Russia of this timeline would tread carefully against the great powers, understanding that for the time it could not compete with Britain, France, or Germany, instead resolving to focus its sights on Asia, notably in the Near East, as the fall of the Ottoman Empire would open the door for Russia to begin extending further influence into the region, while preparing to strike back at Japan by modernizing the Far East. No Bolshevik Revolution also means no spread of communism to China and the rest of Asia. However, the ideology would instead find itself expelled from Eastern Europe and launched back into Central Europe from where it spawned. 
Having been brought over to Poland and Germany by immigrants fleeing Russia, this would potentially sow the seeds for post-war Germany to spiral into the hands of a communist revolution. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z, thanks for watching. Support your legion by liking the video or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.